Welcome to our small group. Uh, the Friends of the Harry Peter Stowe House respectfully acknowledge that the ground on which we stand, sit, are the traditional Miami and Shawnee lands. We extend our esteem and gratitude to the indigenous people who call this place home. Our sponsor for the Center Poland Club series is Donna's Fabulous Vote Furs. We thank them for their support. You can visit their website at fabulousfurs.com to learn more. Um, our topic today is the Scarlet Sisters, Sex, Suffrage, and Scandal in the Gilded Age. Um, their hand giving is our, our uh, discussion leader. She's the one that's read the whole book. All right. And then you have to go up to start slideshow, which the bar for the way. Yeah, there we go. Slideshow. Can you still see Amy? Yes, and I can see the shared screen too. Um, well, yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> Sorry, technical issues. If Gina, if, if Christina and Steve should get it all figured out, I don't know what to do with this, you know. Yeah. All right, well, so um, I actually happened upon this book before I even started volunteering at the Harriet Beecher Studio, <laughs> which is quite a while ago. Um, and then it was after I was volunteering that I made the connection that, oh, wait, this is that Victoria Wood. <laughs> um, so, um, Amy, I don't know how, are you a volunteer at the Stowe House as well, or are you just a, a happy member? <laughs> I'm a happy member, and I try to come to all the book discussions when I can. Okay, well, welcome, yeah. Um, I think we have many more fun discussions than anyone. Oh, has. really? Yeah. Oh, wow, congratulations. <laughs> about that, um, but so thank know. you. <laughs> Give me an award. <laughs> So um, for, because everyone else here who's physically in the room are um, all very involved in the Stowe House and also act as docents. And so for us, Victoria Woodhall is always painted in the Beecher history as this horrible demon type figure. How dare she try to go up against the, um, Henry Ward Beecher and the Beecher sisters, um, aside from Isabella. And poor Isabella was declared or tried to be declared insane by her brothers because of her relationship or reason but a good time it was part of was her relationship with victoria so to find a book that actually talks about victoria woodhall as the main subject when they're not trying to make her out to some horrible evil woman kind of figure was really quite refreshing <laughs> uh, i don't know how you guys felt about it but um <laughs> did you have a chance to read the book amy did you like it so we were talking about that before you arrived, and I'm about halfway through. So, so far, I've enjoyed it. Um, I, I found one of the things interesting. Um, well, there were a lot of things I found interesting, at least thus far. Um, and in the past, we've read some of Catherine's writing, and I found it interesting that, like, this author was like, well, Catherine was opposed to women's suffrage, whereas the, the Catherine clan was big supporters of women's suffrage. So I thought that was an interesting comparison. Catherine was against the women's right to vote. She felt that women should um, be like influencing the men on how to vote, but she was also very much into women's rights, which are not quite the same thing. <laughs> um, Catherine is a complex, they're all complicated figures, but Catherine is a very complicated figure where she was so emphatic about how important women's roles were in the home and how they should be seen as like contributors to the family and um, what they're doing as a job. Um, at the same time, she really felt women shouldn't be out in the public so much. And feel free to contradict me, um, anyone else in the room. And she was out in the public. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's like the great irony. She reminds me of Phyllis Shaft. Like, yeah. yeah. 
she couldn't figure out what she wanted. Yeah, yeah. 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 So the woman yeah. who never married, never had a home of her own, was going to tell you how to get married, how to raise your children, <laughs> how to how to run your own home. Yeah, um, Catherine was a walking contradiction. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so and and that is, is not horrible, too wrong. And Catherine had a very strong personality too, where even her siblings could not handle her. Um, she was definitely an oldest child. I would say, <laughs> um, but yeah, so for for someone else who doesn't really know Catherine, she could come off as very strained and, and very uh, stern and unbending, and that's how obviously she came off to Mira McPherson when she was writing this book. Um, See, alienated people in Cincinnati a lot and helped uh, contribute to the early demise of the school too. Mm -hmm. Catherine, yes, she yeah. did. Yeah, yeah she kind of did kill her own school. <laughs> yeah. Because she she couldn't get along with things as that. Yeah. Yeah. Catherine was a difficult person, <laughs> to say the least. She did a lot, but um yeah, she's just one of those very interesting people that you're kind of glad she's dead and you don't know her. <laughs> He's talking about yeah, yes, exactly. Um so the images that I got in two of them, I think I actually did scan from, these are actually slides I just copied from um, my lecture I gave on Isabella Beecher Hooker and her suffrage role. And so obviously that's a picture of Victoria uh, Woodhull up there in the left. And then um, down in the center is an illustration of her presenting her women's suffrage uh, proposal to the congressional group in their tiny, tiny little room. And I love that drawing because it just shows how claustrophobic that room was. Um, because you, when you're reading it in the book, it's like, oh, they're in a room. <laughs> and so you think it's like a normal sized room or something. And like, no, that's how little Congress felt about it. They shoved them all in this tiny little closet of a room with this big table and then everyone had to squeeze in there. Um, well, and some of it was that's the way congressional hearings were that you know they didn't yeah. have they didn't have the big rooms with the dais and the committee sitting up on on the front you know they when they did meetings when they had hearings they just sat around the table and so congressional hearings were much more um, intimate where did they put the microphone on the camera <laughs> yeah Maybe that's why it was small. Thing, I'm hearing something. Yeah. <laughs> no, was there like a cord for like your, like illustrator? Like, I don't know. I don't like such bad lady. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, I was sitting in the room. Yeah, I know. So this was um, this was published, I believe, in a newspaper. Um, but it's actually reproduced in the book as well. Yeah. Um, I should because I'm it too far. Very it it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Um. No, it just says courtesy of the Library of Congress. But yeah, so who knows? Um, yeah, it, but it does look like a like a news journal type reproduction, not something you would normally. The things they would normally run in newspapers tend to be more simple line drawings that were easier to run off real fast. Um, but I love how in this she's very much like the center of attention everyone's watching her um and also too she looks very respectable mm -hmm. um like she's uh neat she's well attired of course that's how women had to be or else they weren't taken seriously as opposed to the illustration next to you where she's like literally a demon sucky best figure um it really goes to show how fast people turned on her or or how they had issues dealing with her, I felt. Um, I mean, these two images seem to be like really kind of define the book in a way where it goes back and forth between like Victoria being this wonderful public speaker who knew exactly what she was talking about and then like the public reaction where she was just too much for them. Um, Out, but. The difference between her and her sister seems pretty striking. That her sister was more flamboyant, it appeared. Yeah, yeah. And and Victoria kind of got painted with the same brush. You know, she because her sister was flamboyant, everybody thought Victoria was too. When she really she had strong opinions about 
women's rights and what she called free love. Um, but Tenny was out there being wild crazy. She was, and I kind of wonder if they got tarred by the same brush so much because they were always seen together, dressed in the same outfits, like they were twins or... Um, so I could see how it would be easy to make one assumption and apply it to both of them. I mean, they did open their brokerage firm together. Um, they partnered together. And I know Tenny was supposed to be speaking, doing a lot of public speaking, and then Victoria would pretty much hog the stage <laughs> like a good older sister. Um, so, yeah, their relationship was an interesting thing to track through the book, for sure. Um, and especially as they got older, and living in England and they're married and living off in sometimes even different countries from each other. Um, their letters, I don't know, it could, because only um, Tenny saved her letter, so we don't know. <laughs> you don't have the other half. Yeah, <laughs> um, or no, 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 it's Victoria saved her letters, Tenny did not, so um, because uh, Victoria's daughter, Maude, was the one who kept her papers. Uh, so because we don't have Victoria's letters to Tenny, it's like, it's very one-sided where Tenny seems to be always begging Victoria, come and see me. Can I come see you? Can, like, um, it, it kind of makes you wonder if that was a relationship like all throughout their whole lives where Victoria was supposed to be taking care of Tenny or, I don't know, or maybe like for Tenny, she was like the person, like the cheering section for Victoria to give her the strength to go up there on stage or be public. Well, they went about it in different ways though, because Tenny was more, man she was way more manipulative than, than Victoria, although Victoria was too, because that was their training from their family. Yeah. But I think Tenny wasn't above doing just about anything to get support for her sister and right you know she she could you know but that's how she was raised until victoria got around you yeah um, and victoria was her savior to yeah. be really honest and she did it she you know really loved victoria i think but uh her her way of doing things was very different and also, too, I think she was under the sway of her parents for longer oh, yeah. than Victoria was. Victoria pretty much got out of there as soon as she could and went off and got married at age 15, which is funny because um, I brought in these other books, the the Joan uh, Hedrick and uh, biography of Harriet Beecher Stowe, and then the like feature Bible of <laughs> I Bentley Rose. Well, the so. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's a massive, massive thing. Um, and and it's funny because I went back into these books because I couldn't remember how they talked about Victoria, and Tenny doesn't get mentioned at all. Yeah, um, I, I was like, when I started this, I was like, I didn't know it was going Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so that's also interesting. But it's funny because um, in the Harry Potter so biography by Joan he she firmly treats Victoria's accusations. Um, on the the Tilden affair as like oh it's all lies she's just wanting attention um, Henry would never do this kind of thing <laughs> and yeah and and then Milton Ruggoff he seems to go like he hasn't made up his mind and so he'll like give you like full swaths of like the testimony and like the letters that were published and stuff and he'll be like well, it seems kind of strange that um, Elizabeth Tilden would say these things and then later recant them. And then and then at the very end, when it didn't matter anymore, she's like, no, this actually happened. And he's like, I kind of feel like a woman in that day and time wouldn't be saying these things unless they actually happened. But then he turned around and be like, but then there's like Henry and why would Henry do this? <laughs> so, so he like he's like, he hasn't made up his mind and he, he keeps like presenting like, yay, and then nay. <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm yeah, yeah. He did want to leave with Henry, but yes, yeah. Like, the ultimate way was, you know, I mean, because he really was, it, you know, it wasn't just right, it was right. Like, was the children, you know? right. And and I kind of wonder if we just become so cynical in this day and age that the whole idea that someone who holds himself off as a paragon of morality, we can totally believe that yes, you're human and you will mess up and do something truly horrible. <laughs> um, but yeah. how does really the tenor of the day? Like they said when they went in, whoever went into the to the uh, 
place of the brothel or whatever, and they were going to prove that it was all the women or whatever, then they saw the best men in the city. Yeah. Well, you know, that was, I mean, it was very misogynistic. And it was. Because you were supposed to accept it. And the fact that Victoria married 15 to a man who was so beautiful. Yeah. And then she goes and takes care of him later. Yeah. And then she's a tired for taking care of that widow who was a menace. I mean, he was on drugs and everything else. And her second husband, whatever he was, uh, agreed with her to take care of it because he had nobody else. And I thought, well, there are people who would do that. I don't know whether I would do it or not, but maybe. <laughs> but she was really a girl she went through, had more ethics than most of the men in the book. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, uh, Mr. Ward Beecher, I mean, you started out and said that as donors, it will be a uh, hot uh, portrayal feature. Which is true, but we're not there to talk about any more nature. But if you, I read uh, part of a biography that was written, I think, in the 1930s, and it was a forward by Sinclair Lewis or Upton Sinclair. So it portrayed uh, Henry Ward Beecher as a uh, opportunistic, you know, uh, from the earliest ages, oh, really? where he would. Uh, say one thing, and then when he saw the winds were blowing a different way, he would mm -hmm. say another thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he would think they compared to the Elmer Gansy. Wow. Mm -hmm. He must have been cool with Elmer Gansy. Mm -hmm. Or anything. But, so uh, I haven't had any trouble uh, seeing him as being duplicitous, really. Yeah, and I have to admit that. And he was in a happy marriage, so no. all the way to Indianapolis. Eunice was not a good part of the So maybe it was, so yeah, there was so much interest, so yeah. I thought that's equal as well. Yeah, um, and I, I I have to admit that for me, my research is like, obviously, top for me is Harriet, because that's what we're supposed to be talking about at the Snow House. But then um, I really focused on the sisters and not so much on the brothers. Um I don't know if that's just because I'm a woman <laughs> or what, but um, so I, I do need to look more into the brothers themselves, and I have um, a couple of books on my to-be-read list at the library about Henry Ward Beecher and, and everything else, but I mean, yeah, he does, just even the way when you read what he says to newspapers and things, it's very much, like, as you say, like, he'll wait to see where the winds are blowing, and then he'll say whatever, but at the same time, like, at he was held up as such a paragon um, for his role at the Plymouth Church and in what he was doing and preaching about. Um, and he was hugely influential during his lifetime. Um, well, all the Beechers were, really. But yeah, they're, they're, it's like, they're such an interesting family. He could just talk about them for him. Well, and Henry, I mean, he really did some strange things, you know, he, he, his, his black religionist, um, yeah, all, you know, the things that he did in, like, the, in the church, like, we do like slave auctions to raise money, slave yeah. auctions, can you, can you people, they're prophesied, and he's like going back to them in front of like crowds of people, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he was he was doing it as a demonstration, so I but it was a little bit, you know, off. It you know, was the, very off. It was a little strange. And while he was, in, I think it's in the Rudolph book where he talks about when he was in Indiana. Indiana. Yeah, he was in Indiana. Um, he was also mixed up with a young girl there. Um, but yeah, that was a little. Also, so you know, he he had he definitely had brown issues. On the other side of the coin, he was invited to speak at what was it, the raising the flag at Fort Sumter. So right, he, yeah. He was like you say, he was considered. He's very influential. He's very yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a very influential. You know, right, yeah. Was a 
you know, it was the mega church. You know? Yeah, it was definitely a mega church prototype, and then, yeah. and of course, there's everything that he did in England um, in support of the Union side of the Civil War. Um, so, I mean, it's not to say that he didn't do good things in his life, but he. Uh, but apparently, he had a sense of humor too. Yeah. Because he wrote a novel. Yes. Which got panned, and he said, "I think it's proving it must prove all the people who said that I was really the." How yeah. <laughs> could a woman write that? Back to Victoria. Yeah. Um, what what really happened with Burbridge? Since I've only been about a third of the book, can we, did they talk about that more? I mean, they, they yeah. talk, he talks. She talks about starting it, but did it just it, die? It, of, it, it just kind of like died out. So there's multiple things. There was uh, an economic crash um where a lot of stocks um just lost their value and then Vanderbilt Penny pissed off Vanderbilt so he pulled out all his support um so he wasn't giving them because uh, I think he was also giving a lot of advice on what they should be buying what they shouldn't be buying um and uh so so he pulled out his support and, I, and obviously there was like some monetary support he gave them to set up the brokerage firm and then also public opinion just turns so against the sisters that they just start losing all of their customer base. Um, and once they're in jail, their their house, like they, they lose their home. And after they get out of jail the first time, it's like they actually end up living, crashing on the floor of their office, which is an absolute mess. And they've been totally like, like ripped through by the police and, um, and everything else. And I think later on in another, uh, I think it was one of the Comstock uh, trials, one of the later ones, um, where the court asked for them to turn in like some documents and they couldn't because they said everything's been confiscated by the police. Maybe you should look in your own backyard. <laughs> Were they talking? <laughs> um, so it's it's kind of interesting that yeah, so they're they're left living in, in this empty office space that has been totally trashed by the police. Um and then eventually they lose they lose it even that and then they're forced to go back in and live with their sisters that they hate and their mother. Um and and then once they get over to England, um so they go over to England right after the uh the Tilton feature trial starts and was it 1874 or something yeah about then um so they're not even in the country uh, once they know they're not going to be called to testify and so, so there's and and uh, McPherson kind of talks about this in the book where she's like where did they get the money to all go to England first class <laughs> because they didn't have any because they're at this point just surviving on um, their lecture sale tickets from the ticket sales. And um, and so there's some idea that they might have been paid off by someone on the Beecher camp uh, to get them out of the country where they couldn't appear in court. Uh, but once they're in England, they start giving lectures there. Um, and it's not very well received because, of course, England is even more conservative than America. Um, and... And then both of the sisters um, managed to find very rich men um, and, oh, and have so like loving yeah. relationships with them. They're very devoted husband. Uh, and and people still, even in England, were like, well, they're just, you know, like money grubbing Americans. What do they think they're doing? Um, but in Victoria's case, uh, she and uh, who did she end up marrying? I'm blanking on his name. Um, I think it's. Martin, yeah, it's Martin. Um, it it was just an old English family. Um, he had brothers who were in the parliament, and they're like, you can't marry her, and like, so they basically are like dating off and on for six years before they get married. And um, when Martin dies, uh, Victoria Woodhull inherits millions <laughs> from him <laughs> and his family because his father also died, <laughs> and so um, there's money from there. Um, Tenny uh, marries uh, Sir Francis Cook, 
uh, who was like over 30 years her senior. Um, he was in his 60s when they got married, but apparently he was very devoted to her and she was very devoted to him. Um, she got to be a lady cook. <laughs> and so you can imagine Tenny as running around as like, I'm no soul. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they had a, he had a home in Portugal that she absolutely loved. Um, and they stayed most of their time there. And unfortunately, when Sir Francis died, because it's England, all his property goes to his son from his first marriage. And so she's left with a it's a very substantial um, yearly income. income, yeah, that she can use. And so she goes off and she really gets into the suffrage movement in England. And um, there's even a picture in the book here where they show her wearing a, a like a voter's rights sash mm. surrounded by all these younger women of the English suffrage movement. Um that's like a great series. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so it's got everything in there. <laughs> well because there's less of uh, I love when she refers to sex in the city. Oh yeah. <laughs> Just like I thought, it was so nice. But what? So I have with the book. Writing style is not. I think if I ever got through it faster, the part of this writing style. I just I don't. It, it didn't make it as interesting. Sometimes her words used. You know, I hate when writers just use big words for the heck of it. You know. Yeah. And you know because. It should appeal. We want everybody to know. We want everybody to understand and read. And I want to be able to, because they're fascinating women. It could have been, you know, just not only a quick read, but a, a fun read and very popular. But as you know, like you said, becoming a mini series or a, a best song, you know. But her, she took her writing and, and between a history book and a novel. And it was like, it was hard to go back and forth. Some people have the ability to do it. I, I questioned her. It, it was a little, it was a little it was dry. It was a little dry. And she's got something she wants to add. Well, I was just going to say, it's just so jam-packed. Like, there's so many issues that come up, and she crammed so much in. And, like, I know you all know so much about the Beachers, and way more than I ever will. And I never had heard of the Clafton's, I'm going to say it wrong. So all of this was new information and it's so much to digest, you know, and like every time you guys make a point, I'm like, oh, we don't want to talk about that. And then there's this and that, and like the issues of the prostitution and the opiate addiction and the laudanum and all of those issues that are still relevant today. It was amazing that those happened then and they kind of get discussed, but discussed in a pocket. And there's just so much that's in here. You know, I kept thinking of like the Age of Innocence because that's set in the same time period. And it was amazing to like, in my mind, set all of these characters kind of back in that period and think, okay, human nature really hasn't changed that much in the past X number of years. But she crammed so many facts in and so many characters and like so many characters from history that we know. And I don't mean characters in a in a fictional way, but like so many people that we know from history but it's it's there's so much that everything is kind of on the surface. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it's like she's just like showing you the tip of the iceberg kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and she but she tries to. It's like she she feels like she has to explain a lot right. about everything because she figures that when people are reading it, they're like Amy. You know, if you just if you just casually mention a name or a problem, if right. you don't explain it a little bit, people are gonna go, huh? Yeah, or sort of like, why Why was that a big deal? Um, and she does kind of talk about, I mean, this is this was written in what, 2014, I think? Yeah. Um, and- There is a much longer scholarly biography of Victoria that you can find. Yeah, but um, but I think it's interesting that in 2014, she's already kind of going like, why are some of these topics that Victoria Woodhull was going on about like, in terms of like how women are perceived with the double standard um, and also um, just like how, how wives are perceived, you know, like what rights do wives have, what's considered domestic rape, domestic violence, like all that kind of stuff. Um, 
it's like we're still dealing with that today. I mean, I feel like yeah. whenever like we come to these points, like I keep seeing that picture of those women who are dressed up in like the 19, um, like the turn of the century clothes with the votes for women holding the signs, like, why are we still dealing with this shit? <laughs> um, yeah. And and I'm just like, yeah, and it's been a, and now considering where we are post doms, especially, it's like I feel like in some ways we're like even more back to how it was. Um yeah. In, in the 1870s or like we're just going in the wrong direction but um because... it is interesting it's one of those things you know uh, there's places where i say you know it's amazing you know i i think that we invented you know uh, uh things you know when, I, when yeah. I did the tour you know we invented snowbirds you know right yeah Harry was the first one or the first one i know of, right and, yeah and and we think we invented you know merch yeah, and Uncle Tom's cabin had you know oh my God. more birds than, than <laughs> anything we can think of, you know. And and reading this book, it's the same way, you know. Like you said, when she when she talks about sex in the city, you know, it's just you know same story, different day kind of thing. Yeah, you know, over 150 years ago, you know. One of the things that really gets me is how women back then of course, that had power and money, even though they may be abused in their marriages, their husbands may be having affairs, they were looked upon for virtue. And that women were the worst enemies. Yeah. Today, the same thing, how women support people who are known for the abuse of women, the rape of women, the, the you know, the demeaning of women, and yet they still support them somehow. It's almost like, I don't know, that we never learn. I mean, maybe right. a few more of us have learned, but it, it, it's so awful when you go back and see that it's so long ago that women were speaking out against this and fighting against it. And even their own friends and their own people in their home in the movement didn't like them because they weren't exactly like them. Yeah, it's like like the whole difference between Lucy Stone and Susan B. Anthony yeah. and Alyssa Cady Stan. It's like you both want rights, like women's rights to vote, but it was like it was the divorce issue. I think is where Lucy Stone just couldn't cross that road. But then it was such like a, a deal breaker for her and all of her. What are they? They a the are they the American women's? A W C S or something. Like, yeah, it's like Lucy Stone. Lucy Stone. Yeah, it's it, you know, it's like that scene in the life of Ryan, where it's the people's Judean front and the Judean front at the people. That's right. <laughs> um, um, where you're just like, what's the difference? Um, so tell me the difference between Lucy Stone, Susan Anthony, Oh, so 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 Lucy Stone and her more conservative uh, women suffragists are based. They're headquartered in Boston. Um, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, they're centered more in New York. And um, the the Boston and like I said, we're already more conservative. And it's really the, the divorce issue, the the belief that because Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony both fully heartily believe that women should have the right to end their marriages if it's not good for them. And their husbands are, as you said, horrible men having affairs on them or drug addicts or alcoholics and domestic violence and all this other kind of stuff. They said they should have the right to end their marriage and they shouldn't be stuck in this legal agreement just because they're women. And for um, the Boston and they were like, no, marriage is hypersack. Like we can't, go against that it's 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 um we have to stay with them and but then when you read about them and especially and, and i got like a deep dive into that when i was doing all my research for isabella beecher hooker exhibition i wrote for the house where it was just trying to keep the abbreviations of each group straight <laughs> it's like one starts with an a and the other starts with an n and so it's like the national and the american <laughs> Like, oh my god it's like we think we're bad now with all these um like political group party names that are so similar to each other it's like nope it was the thing back then too <laughs> yeah so one of the other things i found part of this harriet's involvement in all this um you know because she was Catherine very was very you know and but 
you know, Isabella, she didn't go along at first, you know, and then she got, once she heard her speak, realized it was so important. And um, I just wonder if there, because Harriet, I will always start stories in the middle, except for, you know, slavery, and even then, I just don't know. I know she was close to her brother, very close to her brother, because they were close in age and they did everything together. But he was so different than her husband. And she was always in control, it seemed like. So I, I just really wonder her, you know, she wants, you know, she wasn't going to be this. I don't think in her mind this controlling person, but she really was. She was really outspoken. Like, what, mm -hmm. and I think my personal opinion is the difference between Jennifer and hers was she was an anarchy. Yes. And, and you know, many of the women, I, you know, I, I, I hate to use that. I mean, that's, that's not an excuse, but she didn't she already had, you know, Calvin was very supportive of her career, unusual for the time, you know, he wanted her to be out there and have her name on the book, you know, he, he told her that she needed to include, you know, he gave her a name, he said, it's Harry Beecher Stowe, it's not Harry Elizabeth Stowe. Um, he wanted her to be be out there doing. Um, he was kind of, little, you know, he was not a guy. He was a total scholar. He was yeah, a, he was. He was a nerd. He was a nerd. Well, I think he was also severely depressed. And if yeah. you read what's your yeah. book there, there's some things about John John Hatred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was so shocked when I read, you know, because he, he writes to her and tells her how much he misses her, but then he had to sleep with in the end. Uh, because she wasn't there, and I'm going, what? <laughs> and I found this this little section, and I'm going, and he did seem to be almost needy, like so needy, yeah. like a child sometimes, of Harriet. But when he said that, I began to wonder, you know, you know, he was an academic, he didn't abuse Harriet, um, but really, what kind of, I mean, they obviously got together, but what kind of marriage did they have? And he was gone most of the time. And well, I think that they had a marriage where they sat in the parlor and read to each other and uh, talked about what they read mm -hmm. from what I've read about it. Yeah. That they were kind of not uh, equals in terms of right. uh, in what I. Yeah, it was a marriage of equals. Yeah. Maybe brother, sister kind of thing. They did have seven children. It doesn't matter. Do you know how many people I know have, have alternate lifestyles that have I, I saw one last night has has several children yeah. and he has an alternate lifestyle they came upon later. And so I just wonder because they don't talk about that normally in you know at that time unless there's some reason to like they've been caught playing or something. Right, yeah. I'm gonna call from Oh, yeah. so they they really were um, friendly towards each other and like towards the end because their marriage like Harriet's yeah yeah and Harriet's calling him like her little old rabbi because he's got a stain all that weight and he's like bald and liver's and greeny. <laughs> it was <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean I you know I I always saw them as, as half bear and happy you know, they, you know, well, and it, I think it's in Joe Hedrick's book where she, there's a, a letter where she writes to somebody and says, you know, I'm glad Calvin's out of town because, you know, I don't want to have any more kids right now. And, you know, basically can't keep her hands off of each other kind of thing. Yeah. You know? um, so, um, yeah, and it's there. This side was very strange. And the other thing is, she really <laughs> kind of a strange. They do have an interesting marriage too, because for 
Um, she gone for a year once and one water school. Yeah, she was. Yeah, she was. Kids were little. Yeah. Yeah, and she just left them. So yeah. That was the academic. He's, you know, his head in the clouds. He was raising the kids. You know. She, Heather, I believe, says that for the time that they were married, from 1836 to they left Cincinnati, so 14 years they were separate. At least a third. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because he goes to Germany, right. uh, where he met. That's what's so sad. She was the first awesome. of his first no, children. Need to go back to New England, right? Uh, okay. well, she went to Indiana and spent time with, with Henry while he was there. Yeah, um, yeah, and and I think it was while they were in Cincinnati that she went to the the water spa. Yeah, yeah, it was because that's like how there's like a break in the the children. Yeah, just because she went off where she's like, yeah. I don't need to be pregnant right now. And I can really take care of them. They had help in the house. I mean, yeah. He was never near. I can picture him sitting at the seminary reading or getting into texts or whatever and, you know, reading in depth. I just, you know, I, I really think that, you know, you could have been a different person than me. Maybe. Yeah, well, that's true. Because he was seriously depressed. I mean, everybody says okay. that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just is very odd. Well, yeah, because there was really three people that married. You know, yeah, Eliza, you know, his first wife was was He's still there. there, was still there, yeah, was still a part of the. You know, and then if you add in all of the uh, people that visited him, you know, specters at night. Yeah, there. his visions and everything. I mean, look, yeah, like today he would be on some serious medication. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but. Um, going back to our original point and how you said that you thought it was strange that Harriet was not able to support women's suffrage movement. And um, when all of this was coming in the 1870s, this was also when, because um, I had a link, so I couldn't remember it. Um, this is also when she had published her uh, Lady Byron Vindicated, and she got totally trashed publicly for doing that, for going out on a limb for a woman who was again that double standard like why did she stay in this marriage with this guy who was going off having like children with his sister you know i um and and so i think because of that when victoria woodhall came up again she's like i'm not doing this again it's like i've already been down that road i'm not doing it yeah, like, she yeah. already been yeah trashed in, in the press right yeah yeah, yeah. and then and then it's just self protection I, I think it was like a mix of that where she like wanted to support them but she just couldn't do it and then that's why she threw her support behind lucy stone and that camp and of course um Lucy Stone's group also made Henry Ward Beecher their president because I thought it was interesting that the women's suffrage group was so conservative they couldn't have a woman in charge of it. <laughs> so they had to get Henry Ward Beecher. Um, so the second slide here is there stuff to see? Um, I don't know if we really want to discuss it. It's it's like uh, things that were coming out around um, okay. like the, the Tilden uh, and Beecher trial. Um, just to show you like how, I mean, they talk about how in this book, it was like so huge and, and, and prevalent in the newspapers. And this just gives you an idea of um, some of the things that were being published around. <laughs> he was definitely. I have a question. Did uh, Victoria Woodhull, did she, she was a public speaker. Did she also write articles for magazines? The paper, the... Is there a collective writings? Well, because that also in, in, in here that um, McPherson talks about it where she's like, he wasn't educated um, in her personal letters is full of misspellings and like no punctuation and um, and she wasn't a good writer in her letters, but when she was speaking, she was very impassioned, very good at selling a point. Um, and so she says that, uh, who's that, that guy, Andrews? who was like the free love activist and yeah. kept putting his own opinions. Like she thinks that he wrote the majority of the articles in their newspaper and they were just signing their names to them. Um, I mean, they're kind of, he would think that they wouldn't print something they didn't agree with. But um, yeah, so you kind of, you want to hear more of their voice in this book. And, and I don't know if that's even possible because they weren't like from a rich family. They didn't have a childhood that let them go to school. <laughs> I mean, 
Um, and and she and they and she does talk about how even Tenny would like revert into a lot of slang terms and things that would shock all these people. That especially in England, when she would do it as Lady Cook, <laughs> she would have all these grand soirees and she'd just be sitting there as like the American, like talking in slang, <laughs> like all dressed to the nines. Um, so. But yeah, it would be interesting to find something that they actually, like, you know, they wrote 100%. And do you think they really, I mean, if they're, do you think they really read that well, as well as write? Uh, yeah, I know. You know that, and, and they're, they're totally down, they're feeling, you wrote it down well, did they really, you know, they, they, he would have to tell them, because they were training up farmers. They were. There's no doubt about it. They knew yeah. how to. Yeah, and you know, as spiritualists, as healers, as whatever, and so they might have learned it like an actress would learn, you know, line. Yeah, mm -hmm. but in that case, they may have been told them, right? As opposed to reading them, right? right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just looking at the bibliography to see what what was there because she does have a very long bibliography in here. She does, and uh, um, you know, it shows that there's papers. From Victoria at Southern Illinois University and the Boston Public Library, oh. and I just noticed the the white law read, well, you know, uh, connection is interesting too. I I you know that that's uh, he's just a guy. Yeah, they're from Ireland. Yeah, they're from um, some little town. Yeah, it's a little town, and they and they do end up moving down here to Cincinnati. Uh, but I think that's after Victoria's left, and so Tenny was like doing her spiritualist, like healer thing down here, I believe. Um, was it Lewis? Yeah. Um, it was the Eagle, Cleveland in the 1830s. Yeah, she was born in Homer. Oh, so sweet. I was born in Homer. One of the things I know, I have a star of the martyr. We'll have to look that up and see if there is. That's good. That's good. Um, yeah, we should all go up to home and be like, hey, do you know who's from here? <laughs> That's good. Well, I would think that the feminist movement would have uh, already been to home. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, I've never heard of it. Yeah. That's, a, that's funny. It's a, it's a small, small town. Yeah, it's still here. Yeah, there, there's a part in the, another city. Okay. It's like Mandarin is now part of Jacksonville. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. yeah, Jacksonville kind of took over Mandarin. Right. Well, and that's what happened to Walnut Hills. So that was its own village, and now it's part of Cincinnati. So, all right. Um, well, good. So, do you know anything else we should talk about? Um. Anything else that we didn't come up with? Can come about Amy? Amy, do you have anything? <laughs> yeah, we could probably um, stop sharing. <laughs> Well, I'm excited to finish. Um, and I think it's been said before, and I think I said it. Wow. It's. Can you hear me? Huh? Okay. It's yes. remarkable how relevant so much of the topics that the author talks about still are. You know, I was just like reviewing while we were chatting. I was just reviewing a section that seemed a little bit like human trafficking, where young girls were presented to and, and rotated around and then essentially... Uh, became prostitutes. I mean, these things are still happening. Um, we're still debating whether women can be in office, whether African Americans can be in office vis a vis the section with Frederick Douglass. We're still debating, like, how do we allocate resources and advocacy and trying not to. I think Shanda Rhimes calls it in one of her TV shows, like, there's no. Um, oppression Olympics, like no one's trying to win. And, but every group is sort of vying for their piece of autonomy and and you know sort of self regulation is the wrong word but all these things like it's shocking kind of sho it shocked me a little bit to know like oh wait none of this is new marty i think you said that like none of this is new people are having these same conversations in 2023 for crying out loud <laughs> like we're still oh, having these conversations and and Anne, i think you mentioned you know post row there's that whole section on how women could protect themselves from an unwanted pregnancy or terminate a pregnancy if they wanted to. Yeah. Controversial as much as that topic is, again, none of these things are new. It's amazing how much things repeat themselves. So 
So I just kind of. It, it, yeah, and it's just like they say, like, know your history because it's going to repeat. Oh, sweet. And, and also, too, it's like it gives you a good idea of, like, where the country is coming to be like, how did we get to where we are today? Um, uh, which is another way to look at it, too. But, yeah, it's, it's just like every time you pick up one of these novels, you're just like, oh, my God, it's like we haven't learned. Yes. Like, we've sure. never learned. Yes. <laughs> we haven't learned. <laughs> yeah. Put you on the spot, but tell us what it is that you do. I know that you're you're very involved in some interesting things, and and I I want to understand better what what you're what you're doing. Um, you're Wait, was that for me? Yes, for you. Oh, you mean professionally? Professionally, you as Amy. Um. So professionally, I'm a trained attorney. And I practiced for about 20 some years. I currently work as the reference librarian in the law library in the courthouse. So I'm still working in the law sort of, which is why usually, and I didn't today, but usually I throw up like, this is what's going on in the law. I will throw up today's, this is what's going in the law. Like they're still trying to figure out how to handle domestic violence cases. Um, there are still bills pending on how to protect survivors of domestic violence, which is also touched on in this book. So that's kind of my professional background in a nutshell. I don't know, does that help? <laughs> I have a lot of background and I wasn't sure what, what, you're, what you were doing these days. So I was just curious. Oh yeah, no, I mean, so in, in the reason why I usually pick up on abuse stuff is because I started my professional career working with um, child abuse survivors and then I ended it working with elder abuse survivors with a few other things mixed in, but so, I kind of worked in the domestic violence world, which burns you out, but took me 20 years to burn out. So, um, and my hat goes off to people who still do that kind of work. So yeah, no, but I still work in like, still work in the legal profession, just not practicing. And, and, and if someone a challenge, I'm sure you're still doing it. That's why, that's why I really think, yes, just because. I only ever see you on Zoom, so I, I don't get a chance to have a chit chat conversation. You know. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I just didn't want to dominate any part of the call. So <laughs> feel free to ask any time. <laughs> so I don't know. I think we're a pretty um, intimate group tonight. <laughs> I mean, if it helps at all, part of the reason I know Professor. Reuter and her sister pronounces it Reuter is because I went to law school with her sister. <laughs> so whenever I joke with Shelly, I like that's how come I call her, you know, that's why I get to call her Shelly. It's because I know her like I've known her that long. You knew her before she was Shelly. You know, before she was professional. Okay. Well, it's eleven twenty nine, so let's wrap it up. Um, um, I don't know, I think we've talked a lot of different conver like we've had conversations on a lot of different topics and everything else. Of course, this is a very jam packed book as well, um, which any history this time seems to be. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then this was interesting for me because it's a it's a period of history. That I don't know a whole lot. I never really knew a whole lot about. Yeah. Um, pre-Civil War, through Civil War, and I forget, you know, never got to the rest of it. So I learned a lot from Yes, you know. The 1870s and the 1880s, I would, I've always been fascinated by them because it's like after the Civil War, we're basically we're trying to like rewrite our, our history or everything. And then we're coming up on the, the centennial, which really still influences us to this day um, because it was Get, while dealing with the centennial that um, America really formed its um, its own cultural history of what they thought it was important. Um, so that's where you get like this, like Washington is God, the founding fathers are all yeah. gods, you know, like all that stuff. Because um, prior to them, I was like, no, they were human. They like had mistakes. <laughs> and, and of course you had Jefferson and um, all his family going like, oh no, he didn't sleep with black people. I mean, the book we read last time was How Borders Passed. Uh -huh. I mean, I, you know, that still bothers me. I, and I have suggested it. I've sold it at the Stone House to a young African-American 
college student who was who was looking for a book and at the time I just had a blanket. And uh, this just amazed me to me how we, your point, this whole patriotic thing about these people that we made into gods. Mm -hmm. They were human with many faults and, and you know, not necessarily uh, the kind of people that we would necessarily want to respect in many mm -hmm. yeah, they, they were struggling, you know, from, I, I agree, you know, I, I spent way too much time in the last year reading Jefferson biographies and the end. So, it's easy to get sucked into that. It is. I've, I've read way too much about Jefferson and spent way too much time, you know, thinking and, and reading about about him and Seth and his family. Um, and he again is is a contradiction in terms. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you don't know anything about his personal life, then you read his his you know political writings. Um, you still find a strange combination um, because he has horrific racist views, um, but at the same time, he wrote the Declaration of Independence. How does that? How does that? I yeah. yeah. It's, when, it's, when you talk it's, about someone who's writing a document about, about freedom and rights for all, except for. <laughs> <laughs> and, but again, we we have to remember that you know it's kind of like reading Uncle Tom's Cabin and getting to parts that you go, oh, Harriet, did you really say that? You know, and, and, and you think he was no problem. She was. He was a person of his time, and and he he got past it in some ways, and he wasn't able to in others. You know. That's where, you know, bring to today, I look at, you know, all of these folks who are saying, you know, we need to come back and do exactly what the founders said. And oh, gosh, you know, those people drive know, me up the wall. And I'm like, wait a second, you know, things have changed. You know, we've, yeah. got to, we've got to think outside the box, so to speak. But they don't know what the founders said, and that's part of it. Yeah, uh, that's your own. I'm not in real history, but I'll be very honest. I guess when I got involved in inheritance or so, it's because of Harvard. And um, uh, so I, you know, look at things a little differently sometimes. But many people have no knowledge or limited knowledge. They only have what they were taught in school, which was, at least for my era, uh, pretty limited. And now we're back to not even wanting to teach. We want to change the story completely yeah. about our past Absolutely. to make us feel better. And that's just amazing. But it sounds like it's been going on for a long time. You yeah. change the story to make you feel better so you can, and look better. It, there's always been a control of the narrative. Right. Um, it's, it's tribal thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe hey, you've got your hand up again. Join in. Sorry, I tried to raise my hand so I don't just start talking because I have a habit of doing that too. Um, I was gonna say like, wait, what was I gonna say? Hold on, it'll come back to me. I promise. Um, wait, I'm Sorry. having a total. I like Sorry, lost my train of thought. Hmm. Yeah, I turned it on. It it's like I was I mean everyone's kind of touched on it that like we don't necessarily get taught all of the history oh that was a piece of what I was going to say like one of the it, it relates to the mythology basically of our founding I think someone mentioned that this was coming up on the centennial when they were writing all the Victor, you know Victorian things were coming up on the centennial or right after it um and so it like I'm preparing to read the Iliad. There is a point to my rambling, I promise. And so in doing so, like I'm also in a group where we're reading Troilus and Cressida, which is why they said, go ahead and check out the new translation of the Iliad. And we were also talking about Julius Caesar in that same Shakespeare group. And my point is like a lot of the time people mythologize their leaders and their founders. And in that mythology, they're, you know, 
sacrosanct or, you know, without flaw, but the reality is they're human beings. And our founders is United States, is the United States, like we mythologize them and students are taught, haha, there was my thought. Students are taught the mythology because our foundation is based on that mythology, but the flaws are completely left out. And then as, an, as a later teen or an adult or an older learner, you realize, oh man, they were really, really problematic. But we're not taught that because that would undermine, you know, the mythology and the mythos of our founding. So it's so complicated and so problematic. And there's yeah. just so much there. But no one wants to underpin, like, you know, g great American mythology. Right. Yeah. You know, Washington's got to be the father of the country. Right. Got yeah. To be perfect. It, it's like it's like the story of Washington cutting down the cherry trees, which is like when I learned it in school, they said, "Oh, this is a made up story, but we're still going to teach you this." <laughs> mm -hmm. Like I just remember that being like what of like six or something. Like, wait, you said it's a lie, but why did you tell me? Yeah, talking about it, you're yeah. saying it's a lie. Yeah, yeah. 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 you're told it's the truth, right? Yeah, you know, I'm still so happy. Like when, by the time you were around, that that they told you it was lies. You yeah. know, and you can talk about these lies and yeah, and you. Know, I don't even know if I was taught it was a lie until I was much older. Yeah. 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 So. All right. Well, thanks very much. This was good. Yeah, it's a very good I, I know this is my speech that I'm supposed to give, but for the small group, we all know about it. But Amy, you know, our interview your tour of pause until February because we're doing the left for HVAC work. If you go on Facebook, you can see, you can see videos of, of Abigail and Christina taking us on tours of the construction, if you're interested. We're still offering group walking tours and now make presentations. So come see us. Yes. Thank you, Amy. And Yay. thank you for joining us, Amy. Thanks, Amy. Oh, my pleasure. I'm uh, glad I got um, to. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm John Getz's presentations. He, um, John Getz's presentations. Um, this goes with group are starting again this Wednesday, also. Um, so yeah, and I think I'll he's talking about Native American this week. This week. you know, he always has such good topics, and I always, always have a meeting on the first Wednesday of the month, so I can't ever go. <laughs> well, and I'm gonna try. I'll be at a conference okay. this week, but I'm gonna try to zoom in to to Professor Getz's lectures because I love those. Excellent. Thanks very much. We'll see you then. Bye. See you then.